Islamic Research Foundation, Bombay. A medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to make the proper clarification as well as removing misconceptions about Islam, his main mission in life. He is a keen student of Islam and comparative religion. In the last three years itself, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 300 public talks abroad in addition to his many talks in India. He has also participated in many symposia and debates with prominent personalities of other faith. May I call upon Dr. Zakir to make his presentation on the topic of the day, Was Christ Really Crucified? Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain amma abad. Auz billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa qawlihim. Inna qatalna al-Masiha. Isa ibn Maryama, Rasulullah, wa ma qatulluhu wa ma salabuhu, wa lakin shubbihalhum, wa inna allazi naqtulufu fihi la fi shakkin min. Ma lahum bihi min ilm, illa tiba azzan, wa ma qatulluhu yakina. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yasir li amri, wa ahlul ugdatam lisani, yafkahu kawli. Respected Pastor Ruknuddin, or as he likes to be called, Pastor Rockney, Henry Pio, Pastor Saji, the respected pastors from various churches of Bombay, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. Before I dwell into the topic, I would like to clarify the position of Jesus, peace be upon him, in Islam. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. One may ask that if Muslims and Christians both love and respect Jesus, peace be upon him, then where is the parting of ways? The major difference between Islam and Christianity is the Christian's insistence on the supposed divinity of Jesus, peace be upon him. And they say that he was crucified on the cross and he died for the sins of humanity. The topic of today's debate, if you have forgotten, is was Christ really crucified? And since we Muslims and Christians both believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, it's obligatory that we put forth both point of view, the Muslim and the Christian point of view. As far as the Muslim point of view is concerned, we believe the most authentic and sacred book, which is the word of God, is the glorious Quran. And I started my talk by reciting a verse from the Glorious Quran, from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, which gives the verdict, the Islamic viewpoint, regarding the topic of today's debate, was Christ really crucified? And since Pastor Rockney, he's an Arab Christian missionary, Arabic is his mother tongue, I do not have to translate the meaning of what I recited in the beginning of my talk for him to realize, to understand what is the Islamic viewpoint. But since most of us don't understand Arabic, Arabic is not a mother tongue, I would like to translate the verse which I recited in the beginning of my talk from Surah Nisa, 
chapter number 4, verse number 157, which says, They said, the Jews, in boast, Inna katalna al-Masiha is ibn Maryam. That we killed Christ, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Wama katluhu, wama salabuhu. They did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. Wala kin shubbi halahum. But it was made to appear so. And all those who differ therein are full of doubts. Malahum bihi min ilm with no certain knowledge. With only conjectures to follow. For a surety they killed him not. This verse of the glorious Quran is so explicit, unambiguous, making it very clear that the Islamic viewpoint is. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. For a surety, they killed him not. No one can be more explicit, more unambiguous, more unequivocal than the Quran in this verse saying that he was not killed. If I conclude my presentation right now without commenting or refuting, on the biblical point of view, what the pastor has presented. As far as the debate is concerned, it will be a draw, it will be neutral. That the Muslims say, according to the Quran, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not really crucified. And the Christian, according to their understanding of the Bible, they say he was crucified, it would be a draw. But I will not do that. I will prove from the Bible itself, with the Christian's belief to be the word of God, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not really crucified. Let me first clarify that we Muslims, we do not consider the Bible to be the word of God. The Bible may contain certain portions which we may consider it to be the word of God. It contains the word of the prophets, the word of the historians. It also contains absurdity, obscene statements, which if someone even pays me a thousand rupees now, I will not be able to read from the Bible. Such obscene verses, obscene chapters, it also contains contradictions. But even though I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, yet I will prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified because Pastor Rockney and many Christians out here, they agree the Bible to be the word of God. So I'll prove from their evidence because the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, Chapter number 2, verse number 111. They say, the Jews and Christian, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah. With all your piety, with all your righteousness, as pastor said. With all the good deeds, you shall not get salvation. That's what the pastor said in this talk. It's useless. With all your zakat, with the hajj, with the salah, with the mark on your forehead, you shall never enter Jannah. Unless you be a Jew or a Christian. Unless you are a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, This is the wishful thinking. Vain desires. Cool. Tell them. Produce your proof. But it's not fruitful. Allah says, Ask them to produce their proof. If I tell from the Quran that Jesus was not crucified, the Christians, they don't agree the Quran to be the word of God. So we have to ask them, Kul hatu burhanakum. Produce your proof in kundum sadikin, but if you're truthful. And the Christians, they have produced the proof, the Bible, as the burhan. The Christian says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. Let's analyze what does the Bible says. And they've produced this Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages of the world. So let's analyze from the Bible whether Christ was really crucified. And while doing so, whatever conclusion I draw from the Bible need not necessarily be the Islamic viewpoint. Let me remind you that. The conclusion drawn from the Bible need not necessarily be the Islamic viewpoint. The Islamic viewpoint, I have made it very clear, according to Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It's clear cut. The topic 
was Christ really crucified? What is the meaning of the English word crucify? According to the Oxford Dictionary, crucify means to put to death by fastening onto the cross. According to the Webster Dictionary, crucify means to put to death by nailing or binding to the cross. In short, for a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. If he does not die, he is not crucified. What is the meaning of the word resurrection? Resurrection, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means the act or instance of rising from the dead. And resurrection with a capital R means Christ rising from the dead. According to the Webster Dictionary, resurrection means the act of rising from the dead. And resurrection with a capital R means rising again of Christ after his death and burial. In short, for Christ to be resurrected, he has to die. If he does not die, he is not resurrected. Let everyone get this definition is very clear in their mind. According to Jesus' peace be upon him, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that a person can obtain salvation by keeping the law and the commandments. But according to St. Paul, he nails the laws and the commandments to the cross. Cross, 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 as you heard Pastor sing, cross, cross. He nails the law and the commandment to the cross, as he says in Colossians, chapter number 2, verse number 14. And Paul says that salvation can be obtained by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus' peace be upon him. And he quotes, if you read the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 14. I give the reference so that, you know, people realize I'm not pulling a fast one. I prefer giving references. Otherwise, if I say Bible says this, New Testament says this, in this encyclopedia of more than a thousand pages, where will you find? To make it easy, I give references. According to St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 14, and if Christ has not risen from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. As the pastor said, that all your good deeds, all your charity, without believing in Christ died for the sin, it is useless. And the Christian missionaries, the reference they didn't give, quoting from Isaiah, chapter number 64, verse number 6, that all our righteousness, all our good deeds are like filthy rags. If you don't believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died on the cross for the sin of humanity, all your righteousness, all your good deeds are like filthy rags. And in the words of the pastor, which I wouldn't ever say, he says, if there is no cross, if there is no crucifixion, Bible is less than two pies. And he says, if no crucifixion, there is no Christianity. And I agree with him. And I agree with him. And the pastor said, that he came to India and he spent more than two decades here and only when he came to India he really realized the message of Christianity previously he was only a Christian but he became a practicing Christian from the Muslims here I want to remind him that I have only met one Arab Christian before in my life before meeting pastor one Arab Christian I met in Jeddah from Syria and after he attended my talk Alhamdulillah by Allah's grace he accepted Islam this is the second time in my life that personally I'm meeting an Arab Christian. And, inshallah, with Allah's help, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him hidayah, that since he got the teachings of Christianity from the Indians, he will come back to the original faith, which is Islam, which every human being is born in. Inshallah, after this talk, after having discussion, inshallah, I pray that he comes back to the original faith, inshallah, realizing that there's no crucifixion, no cross, no Christianity which inshallah I will do in the course of my time. Let's see what St. Paul has to say regarding resurrection. St. Paul, he comments on resurrected bodies. In the same chapter where he says, if Christ hasn't risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verse 42 to 44, he says that so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. According to St. Paul, the resurrected bodies are spiritualized. They are spiritualized. Same is said by his Lord and Master, Jesus peace be upon him, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 27 to 36. If you remember the story of a woman who had seven husbands, and the Jews come with a poser to Jesus peace be upon him, and it's a Jewish practice that if a man marries a woman, and if he dies without leaving any children, the second brother marries the wife of the diseased brother, so that he can give her his seed. If the second brother dies without leaving any children, the third brother marries, so on and so forth. So here they come with the poser that this woman married seven brothers one after the other. And all of them had her here means they had her as a wife here, one after the other. But there was no problem. Why? Since each one of them had turned by her, So there was no problem. And later on, even she dies. But they pose the question to Jesus, peace be upon him, that in resurrection, who will have her there? Indicating, during resurrection, all the seven brothers will be raised simultaneously, along with the woman, who will have her there? So Jesus, peace be upon him, says, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 35 and 36, that resurrected bodies, they do not marry. Neither do they give in marriage. Verse 36 says, that neither shall they die anymore. They are equal unto the angels. That means they shall be angelized. Resurrected body will be spiritualized. Who says that? Jesus says that. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 36. Paul says that. First Corinthians, chapter 15, verse number 42 to 44. It's very clear. And there's not a single verse anywhere in the gospel which says that Jesus, peace be upon him, was resurrected. In fact, if you read, it's mentioned. If you remember the story that after the alleged crucifixion, when the disciples, they met in the upper room, Jesus, peace be upon him, he comes. It's mentioned in the gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36. He comes and he says to the disciple, Shalom, in Hebrew, which means peace unto you. Next verse, Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 37, says, But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed him to be a spirit. I'm asking a question. Why did the disciples think Jesus, peace be upon him, to be a spirit? Did Jesus look like a spirit? And when I asked this question to the Christians, all of them said no. And they are right. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not look like a spirit when he came to the upper room after the Alice crucifixion. So why did they think that he was a spirit? The reason is because they had heard from hearsay that the master Jesus, peace be upon him, was put on the cross. They had learned from hearsay that he had given up the ghost, that he had died. They had learned from hearsay that he was dead and buried in the grave for three days. Hearsay, hearsay. You know why? Because they were not eyewitnesses. According to Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 14, verse number 50, it says that all of them forsook him and fled. In the most crucial juncture, in the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, when he required them the most, all the disciples, 100%, all of them, according to Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, they forsook him and fled. Who says that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse number 50. All of them forsake him. So it was from hearsay. Therefore they think and they thought that he was a spirit. But Jesus, peace be upon him, to clarify that out, it's mentioned in the next two verses. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 39 and 40, Jesus, peace be upon him, says that, Behold my hands and feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bone, as you see me have. And saying so, he shows them his hands and feet. He tells them, 
behold my hands and feet it is i myself what has happened to you it is me your lord and master jesus peace be upon him why are you frightened handle me and see behold my hands and feet for a spirit has no flesh and bones what was the time to prove by showing his hands and feet was the time to prove that he was resurrected was the time to prove that he was spirit he was trying to prove that he was not a spirit he was not resurrected next two verses gospel of luke chapter number 24 verse number 41 to 42 it says that they were overjoyed and they wondered they thought he is dead and now they are happy that the lord and master is alive physical with flesh and bones in front of them they are happy jesus peace be upon him yet to confirm them says that do you have any meat here and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and and honeycomb and he took it and he ate before them to prove what that was resurrected to prove that he was spirit to prove that he was a physical body he ate and he chewed in front of them a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb to prove that he was not resurrected he was not a spirit but he was in flesh and bones a physical body if no resurrection no crucifixion no fish and if you remember the story of mary magdalene who when she goes to the tomb of jesus peace be upon him on the third day it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 20 verse number 1 as well as the gospel of mark chapter number 16 verse number 2 that it was the first day of the week meaning it was a sunday sabbath day is saturday for the jews the first day of the week is sunday it was the first day of the week that mary magdalene goes to the tomb now why should mary magdalene go to the tomb on the third day after jesus christ peace be upon supposedly was dead why should she go the reply is given in the verse earlier in the gospel of mark chapter number 16 verse number 1 that mary magdalene goes to massage jesus peace be upon him to anoint him the word is anoint which the original hebrew word is masaha means to massage to rub to anoint and from this root word you can even derive the arabic word masi or the hebrew word messiah which means the anointed one which if you translate to greek it means christos from which you get the word christ the anointed one i am asking a question do jews massage dead bodies on the third day have you any time heard jews massaging dead bodies on the third day and the answer is no i am asking the christians do christians massage dead bodies on the third day and the answer is no do muslims do we massage dead bodies on the third day and the answer is no so why is she going to the tomb to massage jesus who has died on the third day according to the christians you know why because she was the only one besides joseph of arimathea and nicodemus who gave the burial bath to jesus peace be upon him and when jesus body was brought down peace be upon him from the cross she might have seen some life in the limb body but natural she is not going to say he is alive otherwise they will put him to death again seeing certain life in the limb body of jesus peace be upon him she comes back on the third day after the sabbath day to look for a live jesus peace be upon him a live jesus peace be upon him and it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 20 verse number 1 and the gospel of mark chapter number 16 verse number 4 that she finds that the stone has been removed and even the winding sheets they are unbound and placed in a pile the question is why should the stone be removed and why should the winding sheets be unbound and placed at the side piled up at the side if jesus peace be upon was resurrected as a spiritual body does a spirit require the stone of the entry of the tomb to be removed if it's a spirit those cannot stop a spirit from entering the stone need not be removed why was the stone removed and if a spirit has to move does it have to unbound the winding sheets it's not required but if it's a physical body the stone blocking the entry of the tomb has to be removed the winding sheets have to be unbound proving 
that Jesus' peace be upon him, the person who came out of the tomb was a physical body. And the tomb was a private property of the secret disciple of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich and influential Jew. And he had carved a big roomy tomb, maybe for himself, for future, in which Jesus' peace be upon him was kept. The tomb or the sepulchre. And according to Jim Bishop, he says, Jim Bishop, not Bible, Jim Bishop, says, it was very roomy, very big. Five feet wide, seven feet in height, and 15 feet in depth. Why do you require a roomy tomb? So that if anyone wants to help a person, it can be done easily. These are small rooms in Bombay. It is approximately 75 square feet. 75 square feet flat is big in Bombay. We find five, six people living in that room. In Bombay, one of the most expensive places in the world. 75 square feet, you find four, five people living in it. So roomy enough if they want to help the person. Why would they want to help a spiritual body? A spiritual body is only going to help. But naturally, they want to help a physical body. Further, if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 15, Jesus, he sees that Mary Magdalene from the earth, from terra firma, not from the heaven, he sees her and she's weeping. And he comes to her and asks, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Knowing very well what is the reason, but yet asking her. She says, and supposed him to be a gardener. She asks him, where have you taken him and laid him so that I may take him away? I'm asking a question, why did Mary Magdalene suppose Jesus to be, peace be upon him, a gardener? I'm asking a question, do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? Yes or no? No. So why should she suppose that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a gardener? And the answer is because he was disguised as a gardener. Now why should a spiritual body be disguised as a gardener? Jesus Christ was disguised as a gardener, peace be upon him, because he was afraid of the Jews. A spiritual body need not be afraid of the Jews. Why? Because according to Hebrew, chapter number 9, verse 27, a man dies only once. And after that is the day of judgment. Jesus, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 36, neither shall you die anymore. Means if you're spiritualized, you don't have to be afraid of anyone. No one can harm you. You cannot die a second time. If he's spiritualized, why should he be disguised? Why should he be afraid? Why should he be in hiding? Why should he run away from the Jews? Proving that he was not a spiritual body, but he was alive. And he says to Mary, Mary, the one word is sufficient for Mary to recognize her Lord and Master. You know, because everyone has a particular style of calling the beloved one. And the tone in the style which you call the beloved one is sufficient to recognize who is the person. She immediately recognizes that it is Jesus, peace be upon him. And she rushes forward toward him. Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse 15, 16, 17. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, touch me not. Why? Why touch me not? Is he a bundle of electricity that if someone touches him, the person will be electrocuted? Is he a bundle of dynamite that if someone touches, they will blow up? Why does he say, touch me not? Because he was a physical body. Imagine the ordeal, the pain, the physical pain, the emotional pressure that he had going through all that so-called, supposedly put on the cross put on the cross, all that pain and torture, it will hurt a physical body. He says, touch me not. And then continues and says, in Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse number 17, I have not yet ascended unto my father. Meaning what? That he has not yet been dead. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, unequivocally says that he has not yet been resurrected. Proving that he was alive. Later on it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 11, that the disciples, they had heard that Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive. From her, Mary Magdalene, but they believed not. You know, the Jews, they had a habit of posing questions, troubling the messengers. 
The Quran says that, the Bible says that. They posed question to Moses, peace be upon him. They troubled him and they harassed him. Same they did with Jesus, peace be upon him. Further, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter number 12, verse number 38. The Jews come up to Jesus, peace be upon him and say, Master, Rabbi, meaning, O oh Lord, why don't you give us a sign? Sign meaning a miracle. Miracle. All the good works that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did was not sufficient to convince the Jews. They said, give us a sign, give us a miracle. Maybe, like flying in the air, like walking on the water, like walking on burning charcoal. They wanted some miracle. Sign here doesn't mean a sign on a lamppost, you know? like you have signs on the roads. It's not that sign. It particularly means a miracle. And if you read the New International Version, it says a miraculous sign. What is the reply Jesus, peace be upon him, gives? What is the reply he gives? In the next verse, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 39 and 40, he says, You evil and adulterous generation, seek it be after a sign? You seek for a miracle? No sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. So as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, peace be upon him, doesn't say that, see, go and meet Bartimaeus, the blind person who I gave sight. Why don't you ask the woman with issues, who only on touching me she was healed. He didn't refer to the 2,000 pigs he had killed to heal a possessed man. He doesn't say that the 5,000 and the 3,000 people he fed with a broiled fish and with bread. He says, no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. Jesus, peace be upon him, is putting all his eggs in one basket. The sign of Jonah. And for a person to know the sign of Jonah, he doesn't have to be a scholar of the Bible. He doesn't have to be a doctor of divinity because it is taught in Sunday schools. And in most countries, including India, irrespective whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, some way or the other it is taught either in comics or in moral science lessons, the sign of Jonah or Jonah and the whale. They know. But if you want to know the sign of Jonah actually in the Bible, in this big book, the sign of Jonah is less than two pages, less than one and a half page. I had the Zorovs copy done from the same Bible to make it easy. Less than one and a half side. Less than one and a half side. Only four chapters. And to find one page in Encyclopedia of more than a thousand pages is difficult. But everyone knows the outline of the story. That Almighty God, He asks His messenger, Jonah, peace be upon Him, to go and deliver the message to the Ninevites, to go to Nineveh. But he says, these Ninevites, they are so sinful. What will they listen to the message? He thinks that they will make fun of me. It will be a waste of time. So he goes to Joppa, and from there, he's setting sail to Tarshish. Now, while he's at sea, there's a huge storm. And it was the superstition of the Marines of that time, that if there's a storm at sea, it is because someone has disobeyed the master. And they had their own ways in trying to find who was the person responsible. They had the system of casting of lots. And when they cast lots, it comes to the turn of Jonah, peace be upon him. And Jonah being a messenger of Almighty God, he agrees and he says that, see, I'm the person responsible. I was told by my master, Lord, to go to Nineveh, but from Joppa, I'm setting sail to Tarshish, running away. I'm at fault. You take me and throw me overboard. But they say, this person, such a pious person, why should simply he be killed? So they try and stir the ship, but yet they are not successful. The storm is yet there. So he says that, why don't you throw me overboard? And finally they agree, and they throw him overboard. When they throw him overboard, the storm subsides. Maybe it was a coincidence. Later on, a big fish, a whale comes, and swallows Jonah, peace be upon him. Jonah prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. The whale takes Jonah, peace be upon him, for three days and three nights around the ocean and then vomits him out on the seashore. 
What is the sign of Jonah? Jesus peace be upon him says that no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now I'd like to ask you a question. When Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or alive? Before you answer, I would like to make it easy for you. Let's see, Jonah volunteers. He says, I'm the culprit, I'm responsible, throw me overboard. If someone doesn't agree, maybe you'll have to break his leg, you may have to break his, his neck, you may have to twist his arm. But here he volunteers, so they don't have to do all that. So they throw him overboard. I'm asking you a question, when Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Alive. The fish comes and follows him. Was he dead or alive? Alive. He prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. Was he dead or alive? Do dead men pray? Was he dead or alive? Alive. The whale takes Jonah three days and three nights in the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. Fish vomits him out on the seashore. Was he dead or alive? Alive. Alive, 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 alive. When a person is thrown overboard in a raging sea, he ought to die. If he dies, no miracle. If he's alive, it's a miracle. Fish comes and follows him. He ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat, in the belly of the whale, he ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Jesus said, peace be upon him, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah was alive. But when I pose the question to my Christian brothers, and they are our brothers, they are our cousins, what do you call? They are brothers. When I pose the question to the Christians, that how was Jesus, peace be upon him, in the tomb according to you? And all of them say, that he was dead. He was dead. I'm asking you a question. Jonah was alive. Jesus, peace be upon him, was dead. So was Jesus, peace be upon him, alike or unlike Jonah? Like or unlike? Unlike. So Jesus, peace be upon him, does not fulfill the prophecy. He puts all his eggs in one basket and says no sign shall be given but the sign of Jonah. And here the prophecy is not fulfilled. For the prophecy to be fulfilled, he should be alive. As I proved in the earlier part of my talk, he was alive. Otherwise, Jesus, peace be upon him, will be a liar. Now, which we cannot agree. We respect him. We revere him. So for him to fulfill the prophecy, he should be alive. And Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive as I proved in the earlier part of my talk. As I said, that for a person to be crucified, he should be put to death on the cross. If he does not die on the cross, he is not crucified. There are some people who may say, let's see here the main part of the sign is not dead or alive, it's the time factor, time factor. You know, three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Three is mentioned four times. The main important emphasis is three, three, three. It is not dead or alive. I say, what is so unique about three? If I say, I took three days and three nights to reach Delhi, is it a miracle? What is so miracle about three? Three days or three weeks? It's not a miracle. But they say, no, it is a time factor. Let's analyze whether Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, fulfills the time factor which the Christians, some Christians say, is the main theme of the sign. As I said earlier, and we know that when we ask the Christians that when was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, crucified? And according to the Bible, the Christians will say, on a good Friday. So we ask him, what is so good about the Friday? They say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for our sins. Therefore, it's a good Friday. And if you read that it was, the trial was in a hurry, they were hurry for the trial, they were in a hurry to put him up on the cross, they were hurry to get him down, because as pastor said, no one can stay overnight hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, according to, he didn't mention the reference, Deuteronomy chapter number 21, verse number 23. The land will get cursed. So they were honey to get him down. And they give the burial bath, and it is by the time late in the evening. He's put in the sepulcher, 
late in the evening. And according to the Gospel of John chapter 20 verse 1, it was the first day of the week, Sunday morning, that the tomb was found empty by Mary Magdalene. So supposedly, Jesus was in the tomb on Friday night. Why do I say supposedly? Because the Bible does not say, when does Jesus leave the tomb? Maybe he left on Friday late night or Saturday morning. It doesn't say. Agreeing that latest he might have left is in early morning on Sunday. So Jesus was in the tomb Friday night, supposedly. He was there in the tomb Saturday day, supposedly. He was there in the tomb Saturday night, supposedly. Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. So he was there for two nights and one day. But the sign says three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. But Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually one day and two nights. Is three days and three nights equal to one day and two nights? Is it equal? Three days and three nights equal? No. So even the time factor which they boast about is not fulfilled. The real thing is, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was alive. For a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. Just to make easy for the pastor in the rebuttal time he has, I list the major points proving that he was not crucified, he was not resurrected. Because